My name is Dave Friedman, and I do have the honor of being a volunteer here. I have been in the field for 34 years. In a couple of weeks, it'll be 35, and I survived. Um, things have changed. The field hasn't survived too well. So what I would like to do tonight is I would like to talk about, um, you know, usually people come in and talk about some of the stuff that they do and some of the, the, the resources available. What I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about addiction. I would like to talk to you about some of the things that go into it. For example, are we going to cover uh, neurochemistry in the brain? And after I cover some of this stuff, we'll talk about implications that that has for treatment. So why do people use drugs? Before we even talk about why they can't stop, why do they use? Well, it feels good. It kind of fulfills a need that they don't think that they were able to fulfill on their own. And they wind up not getting into it all quickly, but it's almost like falling in love. And that's exactly what it is. Addiction is actually a romance, which makes it even harder to quit at the end. In the beginning, it's all fun. And the brain is a really marvelous machine. It's kind of hard to believe when you read about the brain and everything it does and how it works, that the same being that created this wonderful brain created knees and ankles. You know, I, I don't get that sometimes, but he did. So the, so the human brain, uh, the, that's a brain cell. And it works off a combination of electrical and chemical energy. I mean, the message comes along as it's electrical, comes to a gap. And nothing in your brain is attached. I'm not being insulting, but the cells aren't attached. What happens is if there's a chemical that's secreted into the gap and it plugs in to the guy next door because the, neuro, the neurotransmitters that are secreted, each one takes care of one thing and they plug into the, to the cell next door and each, each neurotransmitter has a particular receptor site that fits it like a key in a lock. So if, if the message is that the world is a good place to be, then the message would come across here, and about towards the end of, of the cell, uh, there is a body there that secretes the appropriate you know, transmitter. In this case, it would be serotonin. Serotonin goes into the gap, plugs in next door, the message continues. And what it took me a couple of minutes to talk about happens billions of times a millisecond in the brain, okay? And that's all well and good, and that's the way it's supposed to work. And people have things that they enjoy doing that give them pleasure, and the neurotransmitter that takes care of pleasure is called dopamine. You're gonna hear about dopamine a lot. Dopamine, if, if you have people you enjoy spending time with, <clears throat> if you have people that, uh, that you go out to dinner with and it's a great meal, and you're listening to really fabulous music, and, you know, you're reading a good book, you're watching a funny comedian, you have pleasure, that's the dopamine. And it doesn't take much to give you that pleasure, for that message to get across. And that's good. However, somebody comes along and says, here, this is cocaine, snort this. And the effect is that the dopamine winds up getting flooded into the brain. What's the matter with that? Well, dopamine is kind of a, a an issue with, with the brain because dopamine, there's uh, dopamine receptors all over the brain, but there's a body in the brain deep down in a primitive area of the brain uh, called the incumbens, and that's there's a lot of dopamine receptors there, and it's sometimes it's called the pleasure center. It's not, but it's called the pleasure center because of all the dopamine receptors. Why do we need this in a primitive area of the brain? Well. Primitive man, or whatever became before primitive man became man, didn't understand a lot about procreation, but knew it felt good. So, I mean, when you stop to think about the way this whole thing is engineered, it's pretty sharp. Also, hunger is a very painful issue. And years ago, they didn't have a larder to, to go hit, and they didn't have a fridge to raid, but they ate, and eating gave them pleasure. So. The brain, as far as the brain is concerned, this neurotransmitter, this dopamine, is going to guarantee that race of man continues and people aren't going to starve to death. Okay. 
So now you have all this dopamine getting wasted, flooding into the gaps in the brain. And this is going to happen a couple of times. And then the brain starts to think it's time to put an end to this. And what it does is it starts to close off receptor sites on the receiving the nerve. What does an, an, an addict do? When they're using the same amount of drug and they're not getting the same effect, what do they do? More. So if somebody's using the same amount, they're not getting as high as they want to be, so they put even more in. They do more. And that's going to release more dopamine, and it becomes a real battle between how much, the, how much are you going to use, and addicts aren't aware of this. You know, we're only becoming aware of this stuff in the last 30 years. So they're not aware of this, but they're going to use more and more so they can get the desired effect that they want. Okay? When this behalf starts to happen, and the addict starts to do more, the brain's next trip is that it's going to start closing down the ability to make and secrete dopamine. And it's a temporary thing. However, um, when it begins, the nerve endings start to get damaged. We call it tolerance. When you hear addicts talk about tolerance, this is why it happens. And the sad part of this is that when this is happening, the brain damage is beginning. Tolerance starts kind of early in the addiction, and an addiction runs a long time. And stop and think about how many years and how long people are damaging their brains. It's a wonder that there's anything left at all. Addicts, by and large, um, will continue to use. Uh, uh, cocaine is the one. Cocaine, crack cocaine, and speed are the ones that use dopamine the hardest, followed very closely by heroin, alcohol, pot. Um, I've had, in, in doing intakes, I've had Clients tell me that they smoked crack cocaine and they felt like they were orgasming. So it's an enormously potent drug. And it's something they want to keep doing. Unfortunately, people run out of dopamine. And it happens. Sometimes you run out. Sometimes when you talk to people who are shooting 20 bags a day to try and get the same high they were doing on half a bag a day. And the trick 40 years ago was that guys would go into a hotel had somebody tie him to a bed and he'd kick. They'd go cold turkey. And three or four days later, they'd come out shaky, weak, but they could get high in half a bag of dope. People don't do that anymore. When people run out of dopamine, it happens frequently enough now that it's called anhedonia. We even put a name to it. Anhedonia means just without pleasure. And that means that not only are you not going to feel getting high anymore, no matter how much you do, but you're no longer going to feel anything else that, that used to bring you pleasure. Going for a walk on a beach, seeing a great sunset, being with the one you love, having great food, having great company, none of that gives you pleasure anymore. If you want to see what that looks like, go into any NA or AA meeting and just look around. Okay? Um, Jeff Dunham is a ventriloquist, has a, a dummy named Walter. Walter is a grump. And that's what it looks like. All right. Usually these guys have these nicknames like Happy or Mr. Serenity or stuff like that. But just think about the prospect that you will never again feel pleasure, no matter what. So implications as far as treatment's concerned, um, don't drink, don't drug. The so people go into a detox, it's time to get clean and sober. In a lot of cases, three or four days, the dopamine, everything will kind of go back to normal limits and they'll be able to have pleasure in normal ways, but this is not something you want to play with and, and see if you can push the limits on it. So the implications for treatment is go into detox, come off of everything, stay off of everything, okay? The next thing I'd like to talk about is, is the psychological. I'm not talking about the Freudian stuff. You know, this is, this is uh, people used to, to see, they used to do these, horrible things. I used to sit there and just look at people until they talk. And they'd come in three nights a week, you're talking 100,000 over a period of 10 years, and the insurance company said, ah, no. But the psychological I'd like to talk to about right now is what we used to call years ago rat psych. 
And when you study behavior and how behavior forms, rats are cool to watch. Um, I'm not saying we're a bunch of rats, but kind of familiar. So they'll take a maze, and they'll put some food in the corner of the maze, and they'll drop the rat into the maze, and he'll find his way, poke his way around until he finds the food, eats the food. The next day, they take the same rat, put him in the maze, put the food in the maze, and he'll do it a little faster and make better decisions how to get there. Okay, so, so very much like the rat, people make these decisions and they learn how to do things. And it becomes imprinted on the brain. It becomes a pathway in the brain as to how these things get done. Okay? It's like tying your shoes. Everybody learned how to tie their shoes when they were kids. Hopefully. Learn how to tie your shoes when you're kids. If you were to sit down tomorrow, and you get dressed, and you're tying your shoes, think about, instead of just tying, think about what each hand has to do. And you're going to find it difficult to tie your shoes. Because after a while, the stuff gets imprinted in the brain, and you just do it automatically. Very much like an, an addict getting making some comments about being sick and tired of the stuff going on in the house, I've had enough of it, all the whole thing. And they run off to get high, and there's particular ways that they do that. They have a ritualistic way of doing this. Like, watch a cigarette smoker. Take a cigarette in the pack, taps it. And you think, you know, what, what are you tapping it for? You smoke filtered cigarettes, unless you're going to light the, the end that's not filtered, you know. So, but people have a ritualistic way of doing things. Uh, the rat comes to a sad conclusion. They take the rat and they put it into a cage. At the end of the cage is two bins. One bin is the first one, and they put food in that. And the rat hits a trail, and food pops out. The rat eats the food. The second bin, after a few days of that, the rat eats once they hit the trail. After a few days of that, they, the second one, they put cocaine pellets. The rat hits, out of curiosity, I guess, hits the second, second trail and eats the cocaine and goes on a really cool little trip for himself. That rat, the next day, is gonna go straight to that particular bin, and he's gonna hit that treadle until he dies of starvation. We really are kind of similar, aren't we? That people, to, to their, they'll continue to use drugs no matter what, okay? To their, their own detriment. They'll continue to use drugs you know, I remember talking to a guy who was, who was a heroin addict, and he had these pits in his arm. And I said, what's, what's that? He says, well, you know, the blood vessels don't always come back, so parts of you just can't support having flesh there anymore. And I, I went to the doctor I was working with, and I said, Herb, what do you think? Is this true? Yeah, he says, as a matter of fact, it's called recanalization. It's true. Knowing all that, the guy was continuing to use. So when it, when it comes time for, for the behavior stuff, there's things that you have to recognize, and that is that people, if they can't get a trigger to use, they'll make their own. The number of people that I've listened to in their eighth step and ninth step, the number of people who were talking to you about the guilt they felt, that at times they had to pick the fight themselves, their loved one, so they could say, I've had enough of your crap and leave to go get high. Not a pleasant disease, is it? So it becomes this, this behavioral issue that people automatically go about their business to get high. So what's the implication for treatment here? Well, the first one was don't use. The second one is that we have to do some reprogramming here. And everybody knows the litany. Litany is very simple, okay? Don't drink, don't drug, go to a meeting, get a sponsor, get a network, call your sponsor every day, call your network every day, don't hang out with people who use. And they look at you like, huh? And you just go through it again. And then, by and large, you, you wind up gearing your groups to the negative use that, that things the drugs are going to do, and the positive things that using the phone will do for you, the positive things that meetings are going to do for you. And you kind of set up this alternate you know, it's almost like the cocaine instead of the food in the second cage. You kind of set up this alternate way of, of behavior. So when the person is triggered and they're upset about something, instead of going to the end of the first path and getting their drugs or whatever they're using, they kind of can take a left. They can kind of go and they learn how to use the phone. People, you know, the, 
you go to meetings and you say, why do I have to use the phone? Well, because if you're upset or if something's wrong, you're going to automatically grab the phone instead of grabbing the drug. People call their network every day, they call their sponsor every day. Five phone calls. And it, it becomes a behavior that becomes very, very, very firmly rooted. Here's the problem with that. The problem is that like any new behavior, if you don't reinforce it, it goes away. Okay? So if you're on a diet or if you have some new behavior, if you're doing things, and if you don't reinforce it, you're going to go back to your old ways. Most of the people that I've ever talked to are coming back from relapse. Almost all of them, I'd say. And I'd look at them and I'd say, so tell me, what happened? I picked up, okay, dumbass, what happened? Well, I stopped going to meetings. And that's always the way it begins. Stop going to meetings, stop talking to people, stop using the phone, and after a while, that really nice new way of doing things begins to go away. And I know this because a very good friend of mine, who's sober 28 years, stopped going to meetings. At 28 years, he got drunk. He didn't want to use the phone. He didn't want to talk to people. He cut himself off from everybody. He was uh, dating a woman who was an alcoholic. We were telling him, you're out of your mind. You're not in a good situation when you do that. And he looked at us and he said, I'll change her before she changes me. Everybody took two steps back and said, whoa, good luck. And he didn't want to hear from us anymore, so he cut us off. He wouldn't talk to us. He wouldn't return our phone calls. He wouldn't come to meetings. And the day came when he was upset and he picked up a drink. He's been out there 16 years. He can't stop. He's now a guy in his 80s. He's probably going to die drunk. So yeah, so people look around. They go, why do I have to go to all these meetings? Um, well, we talk about families a little later. Uh, I've, had, I've had families sit down with me and they're very upset. Well, but what's wrong? Well, you know, we never saw him when he was out using and now you've got him all the damn meetings he's going to that you want him in and we still don't see him. Well, take your pick. Do you want him going to meetings you don't see him? Or do you want him to running to New York to get high and you don't see him? You want to hear from him, he has a flat tire on the way home from a meeting, or hear from the cops in New York, come and get the body. So people make choices. The deal is that people have to go to meetings, they've got to use the phone, there's no way to get around it. There really isn't. We read the literature, there's a lot of things that you're told to do. I used to meet with, uh, I was a clinical director of an agency, and I meet with families when their, uh, when their loved ones became, uh, began to get closer to discharge. And I meet with their, their families and I look at them and say, here it is. If the person that you're gonna come here and pick up and bring to your home is telling you that they're a special case and don't need to go to meetings, leave them here, we'll get them into an Oxford. If the person is telling you that they don't need to use the phone and they don't need a sponsor, and they don't need a network because they know how to do this, leave them here, we'll get them in Oxford because they're lying through their teeth, they're not ready to stop. The families used to get very upset by this. But I want to bring my son home. He's not your son, he's a junkie still. He ain't cooked enough, let's work on it. And this is, sometimes, you, you know, in rehab, you really pound on, on people, the, the, the lectures, are geared towards why you really need the phone, the lectures are geared towards a lot of things. All about this new way of doing things. And still, you know, they're talking to their parents and the truth comes out, they don't want to do any of this stuff. They want to go back to what they were doing before. Okay, so they're lying to their parents, they lied to their parents before, they don't care. So long as they're able to do what they want to do. Okay? What do you do for treatment? Well, the treatment begins to become incumbent on you. Because this is where Al-Anon and Maranon come in handy. And your own recovery, and your own 12-step experience becomes really crucial as to how you're gonna do this. The last thing, uh, the last topic, is the emotional one. This is the one that's really painful for the folks in the room here. Because this is no longer your loved one. This is what's left. 
after the drugs and alcohol is done. This is what's left. The process of becoming addicted is very much like the process of falling in love. When you think about it, that's exactly what it is. So think about talking to an adolescent about this person they just met, and if they're going to say, well, I wasn't aware of them, and you know, I became aware of them, and then we were introduced, and we started talking, and I began to think, wow, I really feel good you know, talking to them. So I wanted to talk to them some more. And I began to feel even better, so I wanted to, and you know, when you think about it, and you talk to somebody who's, and you say, well, how did this happen that, that you got high? What happened that you began to use? And they'll tell you the same things, the same lick, the same stuff, that the process of becoming an addict is the process of falling very deeply in love with your drug of choice. Sadly enough, the only thing that they trust is the effect of, of the drug that they use and what it's going to do for them, because they really believe it's for them, not to them. The emotional part of this is that the person at the end of their career of drugs, you're asking them to get a divorce that they don't want, because they truly believe somewhere in their heart that at some point they'll be able to do this. It's going to be okay. They'll be able to use socially again, okay? You know, there's a lot of expressions in the 12-step programs. You know, once a pickle, never a cucumber again. And people who will sit there and talk to me and say, well, you know, I'm gonna do this for 90 days and I'll be able to use safely again. No, no, you're done. When people start to get high, they begin to reach compulsively and obsessively for the drug of choice the brain has started to change, and it's not changing back, okay? If it changed back, okay, sure, you get 90 days in, go back and get drunk again, see what happens. But it doesn't happen that way. So the emotional part of this is that, that while you're coping with this person that you love so much, they're coping with their own grief and loss. There's something that has nothing to do with you. This is the horrible part of it. So we tell them to go to meetings. The implications for treatment here is clear. You have to go to your own meetings. When the person says, you know, I've had enough of this. I'm going to move out. Come out with the shopping bags and say, let's go pack your crap. We'll leave it on the porch for you. And it hurts. I was 22. My father looked at me. He said, you're not my son, get out. What? Me? I had an older brother who um, couldn't get out of bed. He was so high. He thought, me out? Well, yeah. And thank God he did. The older brother died. I didn't. I think um, it was another 12 years before I was, I was welcome home. By that point, I was five or six years sober. Okay? People have to do some of the horrible things that they don't want to think about. This is their loved one. This is their child. This is their husband. This is their wife. This is their parent. No. It only looks like them. This is an addict. This is an alcoholic. This is somebody who is not yet ready to be able to claim being part of you and your family. al -Anon talks about the author in the living room. He always you know, what are you going to do? you got this person living in your house. And nobody can bring home their friends. Nobody can do anything in the house because he's an embarrassment or she's an embarrassment. You hear about this all the time. The number of people that I was helping to get sober, is they're sitting in my office and they're saying, you know, my old man was a drunk. I never wanted to be a drunk. Well, sorry. Wrong role model. And that's the way that that is, that people continue, that they find the path that they're most comfortable on. The emotional part of this is the worst part. They have to get a divorce, and if necessary, you have to turn your back. Love is not supposed to be conditional. However, if, if they really want to be part of your family, 
then they need to, to walk the line. They need to do this. Okay? And I'm not talking about, all right, let's make a deal. How about if I only drink on weekends and I smoke pot during the week? Sorry, get out. I'm starting to hear about a lot of that from people who are getting clean and sober, supposedly. And they're looking at me and they're saying, well, you know, I'll give up the heroin. Uh, but the pot stays. Why? Why give up the heroin? You're going to keep the, everything else. Well, it's a safe drug. Wrong. Sorry. Well, they're doing it in Colorado. Okay, let's talk about Colorado. Let's talk about that they have these enormous, they're having a really problem with, it, with people getting into accidents and getting these under the influence kinds of tickets. They're having a problem with people, uh, high school kids showing up stone, a junior high kids showing up stone, grade school kids showing up stone. They have a problem with, they have a higher than normal rate of neonates, newborns with, with pot in their system. And the mothers who are getting tested, they have pot in their system. Great. You want Colorado? Really? Nobody really understands what happens to a fetus when you start pouring drugs in it. Nobody understands what happens to somebody who's four years old and, and they think it's okay to use. Or they're in a room where somebody's using. We haven't progressed that far in our research. I'll bet you it's not healthy. There's been a lot of things about I have a right to do this kinds of stuff. I don't know if some of you guys will remember this, but I think it was um, 1980, 81, there was, you know, the, 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 there was a lot of stuff coming out about pregnancy and what alcohol does, but they don't know when it starts, which drink, the first drink, or the thousandth, okay? So why drink? And there was a woman who was, who was out to lunch with a friend of hers, and she was visibly pregnant, and she ordered a cocktail. The waitress came along with their printed statement that said, we encourage people not to use who are expecting because there's no indication about when the damage begins. She sued the restaurant, she won. She won, because nobody has a right to do that. They interviewed her, and I caught the interview, um, they interviewed her on, I forget what the show was, but she's, she's holding this baby. She says, I had a perfectly healthy baby. Ten fingers, ten toes, you know. And you sit there and you go, oh my God, that's the only criteria you got for having a healthy kid. And I, what, I, what I would really like to do is go back there, because at this point, this kid's over 30, and I want to sit there and say, so, how was Mr. Wonderful? Was he everything you ever hoped a child would be? Did he have problems in school? Any regrets? You want to blame somebody? And there's, there's, there's a lot about the emotional part of it. There's a lot about it that just doesn't, it doesn't ring true. It doesn't, it's not fair. Somebody wants to get high, you suffer. What's gonna happen with this is that you have to toe the line. This is gonna take going to al -Anon, going to nar -Anon. As far as, um, I'm gonna offer some opinions um, about treatment. They're only my opinions. It's based on observation. There's a lot of rehabs out there. How many rehabs are in South Florida right now? What's the last count, 800, 900? Over 500. Over 500, Dade County. How can they afford to all be in existence? There's a lot of money in this, okay? And it's your money. I mean, people, they wanna send your kid off to rehab in Florida, well that's cool. And after they're finished with, with rehab, then you want them in their very own IOP because they, they're not finished making money off of you yet. I had a client. And the client kept on getting phone calls from the rehab. And the rehab kept on saying, you know, we think he's uh, not quite ready to leave yet, but you know, insurance isn't paying, we need five grand. When she got up to 14 grand, she finally said, I can't do this. 
pension's gone, everything's gone, I'm, I'm done, I can't do this. I remember getting uh, uh, clients and, and you know, you, you talk to the clients and they hand you their insurance card and you get an authorization. And then you talk and you get connected to claims and say, okay, what's left? And they tell you, nothing. Nothing's left. What do you mean nothing's left? Well, inpatient's gone, partial care is gone, partial hospital's gone, IOP is used up, and all of their outpatient counseling and groups are used up. We have a little urine testing left if you're gonna do that. And you sit there and, and you think, what's going on? I'm a contract prof uh, profession. I mean, I have these contracts, these insurance companies that tell me I can't do any more than copay coinsurance deductible. So I served this person because I already started with them. And I think their copay was 25 bucks. They're 25 bucks a week. And that's, that's the contract. Meanwhile, the guy that referred him to me, yeah, we think you'd be really good for him. We know you, you sold me a line of crap. The next time he called, I was gonna say, let me have his insurance number. I wanna see what you left. And he hung up, so. Um, so my opinion is to be very careful with rehabs. Really careful. My opinion is that rehabs are saying, well, we have this ILP, they own the ILP. Guess what they're gonna do? Okay, my opinion is that instead of putting somebody in a group for nine hours, three hours, three nights a week, send them to outpatient. And here's why. Generally, the person at the front of the room in an ILP is not a licensed clinician. Probably somebody who is working on their CABC or working on their bachelor's degree. Okay? Um, on top of that nine hours is one hour extra. You can't do it during nine hours because nine hours is by itself. Is an hour of family and an hour of individual. So places don't do that. Because in order to do that, they have to cough up two hours of, of licensed clinician time. And that's expensive. There are some, some IOPs probably within 20 miles a year. Now you hear clients tell me all the time that if you want to buy drugs, go there before the ILP, buy them in the parking lot. And you sit there, I see people nodding. And you sit there and you, and you think, what is this crap? I ran an ILP. I was always out in the parking lot chasing these animals out of there. Go sell somewhere else. Get out of here. I'm calling the cops. And they leave. So they buy their drugs in a parking lot, they use them in the bathroom, and they sit through three hours a group. And it's all stuff they got in rehab anyway. So my opinion is that you find somebody who is an outpatient clinician. How do we do this? Well, you can call your insurance company. And here's a series of questions that you can ask. When that person picks up the phone, they should say, how did you find out about me? And you, you said, okay, you know, this is how I learned about you. The next question should be, what problems are we talking about? And you discuss that on the phone. The next question after that is, have they been seen by anybody before? Have they worked on this before? What was the outcome? The last question is, how are you paying for it? That's the last question. If you're calling an outpatient clinician, and if that person picks up the phone and says, yeah, I have an opening, you got insurance? I know. They already told you what's important. Because this person might have problems that that's over their head. So if somebody's talking to me about their daughter who's having difficulties due to um, having been assaulted, having, having gone through all this stuff, I'm gonna tell them, don't send them to me, send them to a woman. We're gonna do better with this. I don't want that money. This person needs help. I don't need money that badly. So there's a whole bunch of questions for you to ask. If that person's interested in how you're gonna pay for this first, no. If they say they don't have insurance, 
and you're insisting on 65 to 100 bucks an hour, go call somebody with a heart, would you please? There's a, there's a whole lot of, of young people coming into the field. We were talking about this before. There's a whole lot of people, young people coming into the field. Uh, you know, very frankly, I'm kind of happy but towards the end of my career because it, it's really, I don't get it. Why are you coming into this career? There's not a lot of money in this, even if you do it right. I always had a good laugh when clients would look at me and say, you're only doing this for the money. Really? Where is it at? Bring it in, okay? There's, there's a lot of things that people need to learn about what's, what's going on. I, I went to a training. I go to trainings all the time, more than I need to. I'm always reading. I belong to two clipper services, one for mental health and social work, and one for addiction and mental health. If something looks good, I'll go ahead and I'll read it, see if I, can, if I can use it. Find out if people do that, that you want to send your kids to. So I go to this training, and the name of the training is how to work with 12-step resistant people. Where do I sign up? That's been my whole career, gangway, come on. And the guy comes in, and I'm sitting there, and I recognize some people around the room who've also been in the field forever. And the person's the whole point. But what this person is saying is that abstinence is no longer a goal. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, did I hear this right? Abstinence is no longer a goal? So it's okay if people continue to use? Why are they coming to the office? Why are they doing anything with this? And he spent five hours laying out why abstinence was so harmful. The old time, the other old timers in, in, in the room, we kind of looked at each other like, huh? Is this guy nuts? But there was a lot of younger people in that room nodding up and down and agreeing with them. So you might want to check if you're looking for a good outpatient person, you might want to check and see if they have any experience with what you need. You might want to check if they have the same philosophy that you need. Because I, I don't think anything's wrong with abstinence. I don't think anything's wrong with it. So it's okay that if somebody's going to meetings, they're also hitting on the pot, they're also drinking, they're also shooting heroin now and then. Is that what you want me to believe? And evidently that was it. And they came out with the satisfaction survey afterwards, and as far as I was concerned, if, if my satisfaction survey came out true, he'd be having radishes grow in his stomach as we speak. Because as far as I'm concerned, the guy was selling poison. There's a lot of reasons why little Johnny can't give up the drugs. We don't need to encourage him. We don't need to look at him and say, that's okay, Johnny, we know you tried your best. This ain't T-ball, this is life. So people don't stop using because there's a huge reward with, with using drugs. People don't stop using because they don't want to go to the meetings. They're not, being, they're not reinforcing this new stuff that they were taught about how to get through this. And they wind up going back to old behaviors. There's a lot of reasons why kids just addicts don't want to give it up. Okay? Nancy Reagan, wonderful lady, I won't say anything nasty about her, came out with a comment when old Ron was president. And she said, just say no. And I remember going to meetings and everybody is laughing about just say no. Hey, did you say no today? That kind of stuff. And the sad part of this is, that just say no works if you're clean and sober. So the people who can value from just say no didn't need it. People who get up in the morning clean and sober have a choice. They can use or not. And that's the only time addicts have that choice. If they're using, they don't have a choice. I never believed in, in inpatient rehabs until a friend of mine <clears throat> went inpatient. And, and I understood that if he hadn't done that, he'd have died, he couldn't have stopped. Well, that, my philosophy obviously changed. People need to get the treatment that they need not what my judgment and my stupidity is going to talk about.
So I hope um, hope to, that you found some some education in all this. Um, it's really not as grim as it sounds. Just don't watch the news. Um, thank you for being here tonight, and thanks for this honor. Thank you.